as we are driving through the rainforest right now, there's a lot going on in my head. Being in a new country, you have to adapt to the environment and live by the rules. Safety is always a priority, and not just outside around people, but around animals I'm about to shoot. I usually do my research ahead of time, and you have to know what you can and can't do and how, and be ready to protect yourself. Sometimes you forget because you're so focused on the shot and you don't see anything else. And my problem is that I don't know how to stop. Even when I think I got a shot, I still keep going because it's so exciting. It's the rainy season here in Costa Rica, and this type of weather can continue for days. The gear gets wet, everything is humid, you pick up a camera, swap the lens, miss a shot, and try again. My glass is getting foggy, so I bet this is gonna get foggy in a second. An animal that has already been around at the dinosaur age about 145 to 166 million years ago and they still look almost the same as their ancient ancestors. The American crocodile can grow up to 6 meters and weigh over 900 kilos. Because of issues with hunting, loss of habitat and pollution, the crocodile population has been dwindling. In some areas in Central America and the rest of the continents, they were even considered endangered. In Costa Rica, they currently hold the status of vulnerable, while the caiman has moved up to the least concern. They will eat anything they can catch, from birds to fish, iguanas, turtles, deer, and yes, even humans. They tend to frequent river beds and can lay in the sun for hours to get their body temperature back under control after hunting in the cold waters. The best spot in all Costa Rica to see crocodiles is the Garculis River Bridge. Here you won't just see a couple of crocodiles, but hundreds of them. Tarcules River is located on the road towards Jaco on the central Pacific side of Costa Rica. It isn't a beautiful river, but certainly amazing to see the monsters below. Unfortunately, Tarcules River is one of the most contaminated and polluted rivers in Costa Rica. The amount of American crocodiles in this river is simply astounding. So much so that this river is considered to have the highest population of crocodiles in the world. Just a few miles down the river opens up the beautiful scenery of the coast where you can see a new world. In Costa Rica, brown pelicans are found along the Pacific and Caribbean coastline, though they are much more common in the Pacific. In fact, throughout many areas of Costa Rica's Pacific, hundreds of brown pelicans can be spotted in a single day. But we will see more of them during our journey later. What we came here to see is not the pelicans or the monkeys. In order to see this animal, we had to fly above the trees.
This animal once was nearly extinct in Costa Rica. They usually fly in groups, and even though they are huge and loud, they are often hard to spot. A flash of brilliant red, blue, and yellow, and a loud squawk, and you know you are very close. There is nothing quite like the sight of wild scarlet macaws flying overhead or contentedly gathered in bunches in a treetop to give you the full feeling of being in the tropics. Their distinctive noisy cry carries for miles, so you can typically hear them before you see them. Macaws are the largest flying parrots. Macaws are rarely found alone, as they prefer to raise a ruckus in groups. They are a monogamous species, mating for life. A pair is almost always seen together. That means if your partner dies, you are alone. Forever. Now that's true love, I would say. Unfortunately, the bird's striking colors makes them a favorite on the world illegal pet market. Macaws in Costa Rica are losing their homes to deforestation and poaching. Hunters shoot the birds for food and feathers, extracting their nests to steal the chicks. Many poachers cut down trees to access the chicks, which limits the number of places to nest. This affects the macaw's ability to raise their young. Chicks are sold in the illegal pet trade, as macaws are highly prized. This illegal capture has devastated populations in the wild. Macaws are endangered, with an estimated 2,500 to 5,000 remaining in the wild today. He's like scratching himself on something. This same area is highly populated by another special species that we came to find. This little guy has a talent of camouflaging and he's not in a rush to do it. We are talking about the world's slowest mammal. More than that, they sleep 15 to 20 hours a day. So I would give him the laziest animal in the world title as well. They may have cute piggy faces, but wild sloths aren't the kind of creatures you would want to cuddle up with at night. A sloth's fur actually serves as a self-contained ecological community, supporting colonies of moths and algae. Along with helping sloths blend in with the vegetation, the mammal's personal algae gardens also serves as a food source. That's right, sloths eat algae that grows out of their own fur. Sloths have little reason to leave the safety of the rainforest canopy. But once a week, the sluggish animals descend to the base of their favorite tree in order to defecate. The exact reason why sloths make this dangerous journey is still a mystery, but researchers believe that it may help maintain the algae gardens in their fur. A sloth can turn its head up to 270 degrees, looking almost completely behind itself. 
Sloths spend 90% of their time upside down and most of their lives on the trees. It can take a sloth up to 30 days to digest one leaf. In order to avoid accidentally poisoning themselves, sloths never eat too many leaves from one tree. Sloths are sluggish because of what they eat, twigs, leaves, and flowers, and are low in energy and lack much of the nutrients required, like fats and protein, for a well-balanced meal. I hate spiders. I honestly did not know what I signed up for when we went for that night jungle exploration. A wolf spider, thanks God it is not poisonous. Interestingly enough, they don't like to spin webs, but they do like to jump. They chase and pounce on their insect prey like the wolves. That's where the name came from. Once wolf spiders catch their prey, they either mash it up into a ball or inject venom into it, liquefying the internal organs into a wolf spider smoothie. One spider we did not get a chance to see is a Brazilian wandering spider. Actually, I would not recommend anyone seeing it. The spider's name means murderous in Greek, which is appropriate for the deadly arachnid. It's one of the most venomous spiders on Earth. Its bite, which delivers neurotoxin venom, can be deadly to humans, especially children, although anti-venom makes death unlikely. Now this little guy, salamander, breathes through his skin, as with many lizards, salamanders drop their tail when gripped by it in order to escape a predator. All salamander species secrete toxins over their skins, which, if digested, can be poisonous. Generally speaking, though, juveniles are far more toxic than adults. It's only about 11 p.m., but the rainforest is alive. For these creatures, lizards, insects, it is the time to wake up and do their regular daily routine, eat, hunt, and play. This dense mass you see is the size of a golf ball. It is none other than frog eggs. A female frog can lay up to 4,000 eggs at a time. The eggs float on water in a jelly mass or cluster. The eggs hatch at one to three weeks into tadpoles. A frog completely sheds its skin about once a week. After it pulls off the old dead skin, the frog usually eats it. Yum! Cat-eyed snakes generally breed once a year. After copulating, the female lays a clutch of up to 12 eggs. What's interesting is they completely lack the ability to hear but their ear structure does give them the ability to detect vibrations in the ground. The vertical pupils may help them accurately judge the distance of prey, especially at night. They probably have difficulty seeing stationary objects, though. Nobody has ever documented how long these snakes can actually live for. The wings of this bird move about 60 times per second. My camera only allowed me to slow it down five times. And in order for us to actually see each individual flap, we would have to slow the footage down by a lot more than that. What does not make sense to me, how does this bird move so much, but remain perfectly still in the air? Hummingbirds' hearts can beat up to 1,200 times per minute. They generally have a short lifespan only around a year. Hummingbird muscles allow them to reach speeds of 50 to 95 kilometers per hour when diving. 
That's pretty much like flying a high-speed FPV drone. It's not easy. So I can only imagine how accurate and in control hummingbirds are when they go for a dive, because I have never seen one falling from the sky. They are the smallest birds on the planet. There are 341 types of hummingbirds on the planet, all on the American continent. 50 of them are in Costa Rica, and here in Monte Verde, there are up to 26 species. You see, humans' eyes have three types of color-sensitive receptors, blue, green, and red. Hummingbirds can see the colors we cannot even imagine. They have four color cones, meaning they are tetrachromatic. With our three color zones, we can see the colors of the rainbow, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet, the so-called spectral hues. We can also see one pure non-spectral, meaning not in the rainbow color, purple, because it stimulates our red and blue cones simultaneously. The bird's four color cones theoretically let them discriminate a broader range of colors using the ultraviolet spectrum, which includes colors such as UV green and UV red. But so far, researchers have made few investigations into what birds can actually see. Kind of chemicals in the soil, it's just the natural fertilizers made it from the coffee pot. We are a sustainable plantation basically. I mean, and I don't know if you can see, but the beans they are covered with uh, like a very slimy jelly that is yeah. called mucilage. You know, you can feel it, it's kind of sticky. You know, we have two main uh, species of coffee Arabica and Robusta coffee. You know. Arabica is the most popular one because the flavor, quality is pretty good. The problem is the quantity of the production is very, very small. Robusta coffee is the opposite thing. That's why they like to use machines to harvest, harvest the coffee. It's quite hard to do it manually. And in Costa Rica, we only grow Arabica because we cannot compete with other countries in quantity. We can only compete in quality, of course. There is a brand of coffee that is called Blue Mountain Coffee. It's actually from Jamaica and it's quite expensive because it's pretty good. People grow that coffee at almost 3,000 meters above the sea level. And the flavor is very smooth. People say that it's almost like tea. For example, if you get 100 kilograms of fruits, you only get 20 in beans. It's a very small quantity in beans. Yeah. But the beans you can plant them as well. They germinate, as you can see. And in about a month, you get something like this. We call them soldiers. You can see, it looks like a helmet. After 30 years, they start losing the energy and then they start producing a less quantity of coffee. Every 10 years, we need to chop it at the bottom of the trunk. And in about two years, you get a new sprout and also a new production of coffee. It's basically like to stimulate the coffee in the coffee plants. The regular height is about six meters. So if you didn't chop them, it will be almost 10 meters. So it will be hard to, to reach, reach the beans. Most of the plantations, they usually hire people from Nicaragua and from Panama. Because if you can see Costa Rica is very expensive, but the economy in Nicaragua and Panama is very less or cheaper. So if you come here and work for three months, you can collect a big amount of money. When you go back to your country, you can basically survive for a little bit longer. The gentleman right here, he was working in the machine the whole afternoon to only get 70 kilograms of coffee already separated. So a lot of effort for a very small amount of coffee. This canal right here is actually connected with the coffee plantation. All the water that we run through the machine goes directly into the coffee plants. We use it like a natural irrigation, so nothing is wasted, everything is recycled. That's the idea of being, being sustainable.
I think that any kind of sugar is actually pretty bad for you. Even if it is brown or if it is white sugar, you know. No chemical process, just raw, raw sugar. And it's actually healthier in that way because no chemicals. Okay. You need to fit the machine. With, in the middle? Yeah. The other way means backwards. You need to backwards? go the other way and you that way. Exactly. Oh. You need to push the cane. Push, mister, push. <laughs> hey. Careful with your fingers. That was just a warm up. <laughs> <laughs> We're gonna do it several times. Good job. <laughs> You're doing pretty well. I can smell the basil. Yeah? It's pretty strong actually. The bean, whoops, is basically purple. Yeah, that's why. Like Cadbury, Milka chocolate has that purple color. Milka is a little bit lighter because. Yeah. This is cocoa powder. Mm -hmm. So as you remember, mm -hmm. from this space, you basically get I these two things. Wow. You only need yeah. to press it or squeeze it, you know. Costa Rica, aside from all the wildlife, beaches and forests that make Costa Rica one of the best places to visit for adventure lovers, there are active volcanoes. Arano was a young sleeping mountain until the morning of July 29, 1968, when it suddenly and violently erupted. When it was over, ash buried the land for miles, 87 people were dead and three villages destroyed. Giant boulders, weighing tons, were launched at a speed of 1,300 miles per hour. Three new craters formed on Arano's east flank. Residents fled in every direction in fear. Interestingly, the native indigenous tribe is reported to have left before the eruption. Again in 1968, 1975, 1984, 1993, 1994, 1996, 1998, and in 2010, the mountain erupted and destroyed. It was considered Costa Rica's most active and dangerous volcano. Over the course of 38 years, it formed a second peak, rising to 5,300 feet in elevation. Can you imagine a mountain a mile high forming in just 38 years? along a chain in the middle of the country. As a result of the northeast subduction of the Pacific tectonic plate underneath the Caribbean tectonic plate, 
Boaz Volcano is one of the most popular destinations in the Central Valley. It is one of the Earth's largest active volcanoes with sulfuric emissions, active fermilows, and two crater lakes. The northern lake, called the Laguna Caliente, Hot Lagoon, is one of the world's most acidic lakes. In direct contrast to Lake Botos, the southern, which is cold, clear, and surrounded by the beauty of the cloud forest. Irizu Volcano. Its name originates from the indigenous word for thunder, the highest mountain in the Cordillera Central. Irizu reaches an elevation of 11,260 feet, 3,432 meters. It is a popular ascent for tourists as its cone offers, on rare clear days, views of both the Atlantic and Pacific coast of Costa Rica. The next animal can live in altitudes as high as 2,500 meters above sea level, and their incredible howl can be heard up to three miles away through the jungle. The howls usually come at sunrise and sunset. They also tend to howl when there are people nearby, rain, thunder, and when airplanes fly by. You can also listen to a ton of howling when two troops meet. They communicate with one another using chirps, barks, and whistles. In Costa Rica, a country famed for its spectacular wildlife, rapid development is taking a grisly toll. Each year, thousands of animals, including endangered monkeys, are being electrocuted on the cheap, uninsulated power lines that are sprawling into previously untouched habitats. Economic development and a rise in tourism in the Central American country has seen a surge of construction encroaching into the habitats of many wildlife species. The electrical power lines installed to feed this expansion use bare aluminum wires that are electrocuting Costa Rica's abundant tree-dwelling wildlife, including monkeys, sloths, and opossums by the thousands. The data is patchy, but a recent government paper reported at least 4,500 animal electrocutions and system outages caused by wildlife in the last five years. Several of the species at risk of electrocution, including howler, squirrel, and spider monkeys are endangered. Refuge for Wildlife, a charity for injured wildlife based in the coastal town of Nusara, Costa Rica, says electrocution is the leading killer of howler monkeys there. In rural areas, there's been rapid urban expansion and trees have been cleared overhead electric lines and transformers were put in uninsulated and wildlife used these as aerial runways. Muy bien amigos, bueno, en lo que es este jardín acá en Monteverde, Costa Rica, tenemos aproximadamente 16 especies en total. En este jardín acá tenemos todo el proceso de metamorfosis completo. Ok, esto quiere decir que vamos a pasar por cuatro etapas, lo que son huevos, larvas, capullos y por último mariposas. Okay. Lo que es el ciclo de vida en sí acá es muy rápido, debido a que ellos son insectos que nacen para reproducirse esto quiere decir que una mariposa en un jardín cerrado 
tiene una vida más corta debido a la reproducción ok ellos son insectos entonces quiere decir que después de la reproducción ellos van a morir ok qué quiere decir esto en un en un bosque abierto y amplio la mariposa tiene que durar un poco más o les cuesta un poco más obtener su pareja acá al ser un jardín cerrado a la hora de la reproducción encontrar su pareja es sumamente fácil muy rápido y por esta razón la vida de ellas es muy muy rápida ¿Qué quiere decir esto muy corta porque en el bosque por ejemplo una mariposa puede llegar a vivir hasta un mes mes y medio acá la misma especie de mariposa puede vivir cuatro o cinco días máximo debido a la reproducción ok nacen y tres horas después van a estar listos para reproducirse ok por esta razón la vida es tan corta igual es un ciclo de vida es un, el círculo o la continuación lo que quiere decir que aunque ellas mueran va a quedar todo el proceso o va a empezar el inicio de ese proceso de metamorfosis que en sí es lo más importante There is a tiny beach in the Nicoya Peninsula that draws in a lot of surfers. A place once used to be a farm owned by one man. In the last several years, this laid-back town has blossomed into a booming travel destination. Despite its size, Santa Teresa has been hailed as a world-class surfing spot in Costa Rica, with gorgeous white sandy beaches and swells that put a smile on surfers' faces year-round. Miles of perfect. Costa Rican surfing waves and a place to go off-grid. Shockingly, the town of Santa Teresa did not have electricity until 1996. Many of us can recall the normalization of computers and cell phones in and around this time. It is difficult to imagine this place being completely off-grid only 25 years ago. But many locals recall those days with fondness for a time of simplicity. Here in Santa Teresa, sunset is a ritual. The proximity to the equator means that sunset time only varies by about 30 minutes throughout the year. So, around 5 p.m. every single day, the main street of the town becomes empty and the beach becomes a stadium. Everyone flocks to the ocean to take in the spectacle and it truly feels like a celebration of life every day. back to the line two times because first we had to get a ticket in order to get a ticket and the second time I forget the mask. You are probably wondering if Santa Teresa did not have electricity not long ago how did people even get there? Can you get there by car? Since it's a pretty remote part of the country. Well you can but it will take you twice as long if not more than by the ferry. So we did just that. The first time I met Chris and his son Atua was about two years ago. When I was trying to find their place, I was surprised to find out they have no address. Chris called me and he was like, just drive straight down the street and I'll meet you there. It was night and raining and I had no idea where I was going, but they seemed to be very relaxed. There are no street signs and the houses don't have numbers. Some locals said, the streets always have numbers, we just never bother to learn them. Atu and Chris used to have a surfing school here and did some lessons online which later led them to be a full-time YouTubers. Atua 
grew up here in Costa Rica and he hasn't seen any different until not too long ago, you cannot buy happiness, but you can buy a surfboard, which is pretty close. Hola a todos, mi nombre es Atua y he vivido aquí en Costa Rica por unos 16 años más o menos y me gustaría hablarles de los animales que uno se puede encontrar aquí en Costa Rica. Por ejemplo, acabo de escuchar unos monos ahí atrás se han, y había, digamos, cuando viajan hay como unos 10 a 15 que van viajando por, por los árboles y lo interesante es que en algunos lugares se pueden meter a, digamos, a las casas y a los hoteles y se pueden, digamos, robar frutas y cualquier cosa, algo un poco interesante. Otro, otra cosa que se pueden encontrar por aquí es cuando hay mucha lluvia, hay unos cangrejos que se llaman tajalines y son como anaranjados, se ven como que si están hechos de plástico y uno los encuentra por todo lado, digamos, están por toda la calle, por toda la playa y si uno deja una puerta, una ventana abierta, se van a subir y meter, meterse por ahí y uno se mete a la ducha para bañarse y uno encuentra uno, yo he encontrado unos cuatro o cinco tajalines ahí también en la cocina, se suben por todo lado otra cosa que es interesante son unas hormigas que digamos son en como un, un grupo como bastante grande y es bueno porque limpian todo, se llevan todo lo que está muerto y todos los insectos que están por ahí pero están por toda la casa y solo son como unas hormigas de un tamaño así y van por toda la casa y se llevan todo pero digamos cuando están ahí sí pueden molestar un poquitillo y una cosa más es que la cantidad de perros que no tienen un hogar o un dueño que están en la calle hay demasiados y aquí toda la gente lo llaman zahuates y es que digamos hay muchos perros que tienen cachorros y después hay demasiados perros para la cantidad de personas de gente que está aquí entonces hay muchos que no tienen hogar three days each year in early July, crabs are everywhere. Thousands of red and purple carapace and giant claws swarm Tamarindo shorelines in a mass exodus. They click and clack around the beaches, roads, and even parking lots. The Tamarindo estuary overflows with them. And these aren't just any ordinary crabs. They are huge, angry-looking creatures, the size of a small melon. Their lifespan is about 11 years, considering so many get smashed on the roads. And they only come out in mass during the day, for a few days per year to mate. Many Costa Ricans who are local swear they taste delicious if prepared correctly. So yes, you could eat them if you know the recipe. In some places, they can be found and sold as pets for $20. However, we found one in our Airbnb shower. They are basically everywhere in the rainforest.
Every story comes to an end, and so does ours. We have discovered a new life inside of the rainforest. We have found out about giant crocodiles in the Pacific side of Costa Rica that live in the most polluted river of the country. Not only that, but we have discovered some of the most beautiful beaches full of wildlife that have their own ecosystems. Till this day, after all the places I have been to, the sunset I saw are hard to beat. We saw macaws, so hard to spot them even though they are so big. Unfortunately, they are still being sold on the world illegal pet market. We left Monteverde thinking about endangered monkeys that are being electrocuted on the cheap uninsulated power lines. Those habitats were previously untouched by humans. Unfortunately, it always starts with us, but does not end. I hope after watching this film, we can all take a part in protecting our wildlife. If a species has a unique function in its ecosystem, its loss can prompt cascading effects through the food chain and impacting other species in the ecosystem itself. Today, the rate of animal extinction is occurring 1,000 to 10,000 times faster because of human activity. We must not forget that we don't own our planet. We belong to it. And we must share it with our animal friends. Yeah. <laughs>